Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. Oh death, oh death, can't you spare me? What is this that I can see? Cold icy hands taking hold of me for death has come, you can all see. Hell has opened its gates to trip me. He waits. He hides. Oh death, oh death, can't you spare me for over another year? I'll stuff your jaws till you can't talk. I'll bind your legs till you can't walk. I'll tie your hands till you can't make a stand. And finally I'll close your eyes so you can't see. I'll bring sexual death Torture. unto you for me. Kill. BTK. Welcome to Wicked Murderer Podcast. I'm Tom Norris. I'm joined once again. He's still here. He's still sat right in front of me. He's gone back to the old hairstyle, Ben Carter. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I reverted. Yeah, gone back to it. I reverted back to it immediately. And uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. That's all right. Why did you do no, that? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Wicked Murderer Podcast. I'm Tom Norris and I'm joined by my boy, Sheldon Shell Suit, Ben Carter. Very, very good. Uh, I shall surely appreciate that. Did I say Shell? Don, isn't it? You're a Don or Sheldon from... The Don of the Shells. Um, Big Band for you. I would take the first one. Not really a fan of... <laughs> no one is. Uh, well, <laughs> they must be, because it's been going on for a while. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Speaking of which, we are going on for a while in this series now. We're, we're approaching the back end. and uh, Double we're, figures. We've hit the double figures. I'm going to hit the free initials in this case. B. T. K. Before we get into that, how are you, Producer Dan? Uh, very good, thank you. Very good. I'm like, wearing like a your very, jumper. very cosy jumper today. Do you like it? Oh, yeah. If I did want one, where would I get it from? Go to icmp.store. Amazing. And that just came out off the bat. We're in uh, shell suits, which hmm. suits the off the bat, uh, gully garms. Um, yeah. Kappa and mine, Ben. That looks to me like if you... It just... says wild boy. Yeah. Is that the Steve-O and Chris Pointius l- line? Well, um, Steve Owen wasn't in it, but it's Chris Pointius and Steve-O. Steve uh, Owen? You said Steve Owen, didn't you? Did I? Yeah. Felt like I said Steve O, but if. I don't... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that the Steve Owen Chris Pointius l- line? It could be anything. Yeah. Uh, after the Snapple thing, I feel a bit on edge. Yeah. But a uh, wild boy. It's, it's not nice. Um, uh, the, the, the jumpsuit's lovely. The shell suit's lovely, yeah. but it's not nice feeling on edge. But yeah, thank you, Gully Garms, for, for uh, dressing us this series. And be sure to go over there and use our code MURDER20 for 20% off, and you can dress as Donnie as us. And as always, a massive thank you to all the new listeners, all the new viewers. We appreciate you all very, very much. We're in a rare position this week, Tom, wherein we can also talk about what's coming next week. We can, actually. Very that rarely do this. We don't really do it. Uh, it's happened, hasn't it? The audience vote. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys, you went for Dharma. <laughs> Jeffrey Dharma won the poll. Was it between him and Dennis Nilsson? Mm-hmm. Uh, me and Ben, or Ben predicted it would be between Bundy and Dharma. Yeah. I thought Dennis Nilsson would make an appearance. I know his name seemed to appear popping up everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was Nilsson against Dharma. And Dharma, Dharma won. Yeah. Yeah. So looking forward to that one. No, I actually am quite excited. It's a, it's a, the thing is, guys, we've got a big case this week. We've now confirmed we have a big case next week, and none of you know what's coming for the series finale, which is also a big, big case. Again, feel free to leave a comment and guess what the case is going to be. Yes. Um, I don't think you're going to get it. Simply we'll say that. But yeah, very excited for these cases coming up. They're very big. Yeah, a lot, a lot to go into, especially with today's case, Ben. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But before we do that as well, to stay in the loop of all things ICMAP, if you give us a little follow on... On Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, which is at Could Murder a Pod, you'll be well and truly in the loop of what cases are coming up, what's going on in our world. We do lots of little posts. You get to see Phil's beautiful animations. So why not give us a little follow on those platforms, please? So yes, this case goes by many a name, and a lot of them thought of by the perpetrator himself, which is quite unique in the sense that there's such an array, it kind of gave mm-hmm. them a multiple choice. They could pick what, what to know him as. Anything you want, Dennis, you uh, take it. The BTK Strangler. There's actually a lot that's going to be really annoying, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 
The BTK killer, the Wichita strangler, the poetic strangler, the asphyxiator, the garrot phantom, the Bond gate strangler, the Wichita hangman. Ooh, there's a few there I'd never heard. The garrot phantom. Oh, the Grot Phantom. All of these given to him by himself. Self named. Yeah. I think he yeah, as I said he kind of like there was multiple choices he kind of gave yeah. what he to be known as. BTK, um again, that's straight away. He he would sign things off with BTK. The most juvenile mm-hmm. little <laughs> drawn little boobs in the B. Yeah, or well yeah, or you could kind of make it semi symmetrical if you did either the B or the K the wrong way around. Mm. If you wanted to have fun with it. I mean, it wouldn't be symmetrical. Well, you, you could round you off me the because K. one half would yeah. be... As a name in itself, it, it, mm. it's very, you know, it's it's very infamous now, of course. Bind, torture, kill. Mm. It feels like his first murder or his first set of murders, because that's also super interesting, the mm. first night, which we're going to go on to talk about. That's when he decided, oh, do you know what I've just done? I've bound, tortured and killed. The origins of this case are very interesting. And the way he found out why he liked certain things is very interesting. Yeah. I still don't understand exactly how that formed in his head. But we're going to get on to that. It's, it's a very fascinating case. Obviously, there's so much out there on this. This is a massive case. This is a massive case. He was able to fly under the radar for three separate decades, hidden in plain sight. Is it under the radar? I did write that down in my notes. but I've... I don't think he did, guys. One of the most terrifying cases in history in that Raider was able to fly under the radar. No, you're at Radar. Yeah, but I... I... Put it in italics, which means make it into a joke. No, you haven't. I've got the notes in front of me as well. This is another one. You're trying to claim it. It's um, pear and apple infused. It's not the flavour. <laughs> um, but Dennis um, Raider did fly under the radar uh, yeah. for a very long time. And his job helped with that as well. But we're going to get into all of these things. But very fascinating case. We're both a huge fan of Mindhunter. Oh, yeah. And hopefully there will be another series because... They were building up for his, yeah. his case to be eventually covered, so sh- and they did it in a very good way. And that's kind of it's kind of an indicator of how infamous the case is if it's kind of an overarching angle on it. I would say if, you, if you're a big true crime buff and you're looking for the, the top four, he would be in some people's top four. Yeah, okay. What about yours? Is it not in there? Dharma, Bundy, Gacy. Then I kind of alternate. Oh, do you? You think about this a lot? Yeah. Go on. It's usually Peter Sutcliffe pips into the top four there. Yorkshire really? Ripper, yeah. But yeah, I mean, Tom mentioned him being able to kind of uh, fly under the radar, hide in plain sight. I think, and we're going to, at the very end of the episode, talk about our lookalikes, which I'm excited for. But I also feel he has got one of, I mean, first of all, I've seen a lot of comments saying he is the most serial killer looking serial killer I've ever seen. But I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. At all. I think he's very much got a, a fa- an everyman face. He's, if you imagine mm. someone in your neighbourhood, I think you could quite easily see Dennis Rader a few doors down. I have actually prepared some jobs that I think I could see him hold in any kind of UK community. He wouldn't look out of place as an ice cream man. Not very smiley, though. No, but not all of them are. I like the idea of a smiley guy giving you a whippy. Or girl. He's a guy, you're saying. Yeah, that's true. The chairman of a local cricket club down the pavilion. Better. A part-time behind the bar of a village pub, in brackets, to get away from the wife. He doesn't need the money, but he likes to socialise and he wants to get away from the... Okay. Postman or a UPS DPD courier. And finally, a non-league football referee. I think he'd be a very card-happy referee. I think he looks like a tax man. Tax man, he's yeah. A tax man, you know, they're going to come after you for not paying your taxes. He does look like he could be at a village fete, and he is very strict on who, if you haven't paid the quid to get in, you're not getting in. Yeah, I could see that. That's where I'd go with it. But yeah, they're all yeah. fairly good shouts. Working in the local co-op. That was top of the list, actually. I just went Again, I don't straight think, I think that's... I could see him his... wheeling. You know when they put all their cardboard in a cage... <laughs> and I could see him really begrudgingly wheel some cardboard out of the store and get annoyed at people for parking near where he needs to leave it for collection. That's where I could see him. He looks like an agitated, an easily Character, agitated yeah. man. Yeah. I am wearing very similar glasses to him with a moustache. Yeah. And uh, you could say I get easily agitated. Podcast host? Could you? I thought I'd get in there before any comments say, Oh, no, Tom looks like he can be <laughs> okay. But yes, there is so much to dig into. So we're going to stop with the possible jobs of this man that didn't do any of them. And now we're going to look at the early life of Dennis Rader and see how he became the BTK killer. Dennis Lynn Rader was born on the 9th of March, 1945 in Pittsburgh, which is in Kansas, America. He was the oldest of four boys born to William Elvin and Dorothy May Rader. The four Rader boys were Dennis, Bill, Paul and Jeff. And despite the fact that Dennis was from a large family, he would go on to state that some of his earliest memories of life were always being alone. Apparently the boys were very hungry, also known as the Fridge Raiders. 
That's good stuff. That's like the stuff I write. <clears throat> Is it? <laughs> now, here's the first warning sign. According to Dennis, and a lot of this as well, a lot of the early life, we're going off of Dennis's own word, which mm. at times he likes to bend and manipulate the truth slightly. But according to Dennis, when his mother was heavily pregnant with him, she fell off a horse, uh, leading to a possible undiagnosed brain injury to Dennis. If you're heavily pregnant, mm -hmm. riding a horse, it just seems recipe of disaster, doesn't it? Unless that's the way that you commute, even then. In Kansas. I mean, you could argue, I guess, a car. Being in a car, if you're heavily pregnant, you, you could yeah. crash. But a fall off a horse seems more likely. Both of Dennis's parents were workaholics and worked extremely long hours, which meant that they spent very little time with their children and they would often leave the Raider boys home alone, which resulted in Dennis feeling ignored and neglected by both of them. Something of which he would go on to develop a particular disdain for his mother. Although his father and his mother kind of both spent a lot of time away from home, it was his mother that he seemed to resent the most for, for, for doing that, which is quite interesting. So his father, William, was in the US Marines and later worked for the Kansas electric utility following World War II. And his mother, Dorothy, was a bookkeeper for a supermarket. You can imagine him doing that job. I could actually see that, yeah. So Dennis would go on to say about his parents, I got along real well with Dad, but Mum wasn't always so happy. I've always loved her. I still love her greatly. But I did have a little bit of a grudge against Mama. I can't imagine him saying Mama. Mm. Doesn't look like a Mama. It's a boy. He definitely doesn't. No. So Dennis grew up in the city of Wichita, Kansas. I went ahead and filled this episode with some really fascinating tidbits about uh, about uh, Wichita. First of all, Tom and Dan and all of our listeners back home. Um, <laughs> Don't worry about us. <laughs> Wichita is the birthplace of both Pizza Hut and White Castle. It's also referred to as the air capital of the world and it is widely regarded as a great place to retire or a great place to raise a family. So you've got... Got a couple of options there. Why is it called the air capital? Yeah, I was going to ask that. Uh, because it was the home... What do you think it has been? Oh, sorry. I've accidentally Googled hair capital of the world, which is Detroit, and Dennis Rader wouldn't be great there. It is called the air capital of the world. Clean air. Oh, I think it might be because of... Or... Fresh. Planes. Think think more... Yeah. We talked a lot about planes, planes last week. They um, build planes. In the 1920s and 1930s, businessmen and aeronautical engineers established aircraft manufacturing companies in Wichita, including Beechcraft, Cessna and Stearman Aircraft. There you go. The city became an aircraft production there you hub go. known as the air capital of the there world. There you go. There you go. And there they also, you, you know, housed the very first Pizza Hut and the very first White Castle. I had a White Castle. I wasn't blown away. In Nashville. Yeah. Yeah, Little Burgers, wasn't it? Little Burgers, Little Sliders. Reasonably priced, but they tasted like ass. And we had a pizza hut when we were there. We I did. We I tried. Did. To, I wrote a little note. <laughs> oh, yeah. You wrote a note in the pizza box saying, don't throw away. And I crossed out and said, take a slice for yourself. <laughs> to was, clean it. Well, careful. It didn't, it, did I say, don't, did I really put don't throw away? Yeah. Something like that. That seems petty. And I said, take a slice for yourself, winky face. Help yourself to a slice, <laughs> wink. <laughs> It's just pizza banter. Yeah. So as well as his mother falling off a horse whilst heavily pregnant, Dennis claimed in later life that he was dropped directly onto his head by his mum when he was just six months old and that he's unsure as to whether or not this was intentional on her part, though this has not been confirmed by any of his siblings or relatives. Dennis alleges that his entire body went blue as a result of this. She dropped him in a tub of paint. That sounds like it. Yeah. If his mum was dropping him on his head on purpose, mm -hmm. I don't think he would grow up to have... You know, he says he still loves his mum greatly and that stuff is a bit of a yeah. grudge there. But if she's kind of mum that would be doing that, I'm sure. So a lot of these statements about his early life and even before he was born came out after his capture, which we're going to go on to talk about. So it seems to me like he's either looking for things, reasons to blame, or he's a bit of a storyteller. Do you think, yeah, he's trying to beef up his origin story? I think he is, yeah. I've got the name. How do I get to the name? Mm. And he's, you know. I've got to hit him head a few times. Maybe mum could fall off a horse and drop me. Or throw, because... Blue. Could have mm. been intentional, according to Dennis. Blue toddler <clears throat> kid. <laughs> blue toddler kid does what well. Mm. I realised... That would have been a harmless story. What would it have been? The blue toddler kid. Yeah? Well, you know why I got blue? Paint. Okay, that's fine then. Ah, I love it. Dennis grew up living next door to his paternal grandparents. His grandpa owned a barber shop that was also a pool hall. Most people go for a, a trim on their own though, don't they? So you'd have to go with someone to play them. Or would you just sink a set of balls by yourself? Is that a porter? I don't play much pool. <laughs> but you do like to sink a few balls. <laughs> and according to Dennis, apparently both of his grandparents were incredibly cold and emotionally absent. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't expecting that from a pool hall. Yeah. Uh, barbers. Um, who showed are you here to play pool or are you here for a haircut? 
It's not a library. Well, I'm not reading. I'm looking at the pictures of the haircuts I want. Yeah, very cold gentleman uh, who showed very little affection towards him. So yes, from what Dennis is saying, his parents and his grandparents weren't very loving and he had banged his head a couple of times. So, I mean, obviously he could have had very cold family members, but it seems to be that he's weaving his own upbringing. narrative. Yeah, a lot there. Yeah, I, I would well, agree. Maybe that's a weird thing to say because we don't know. But Well, yeah. something's clearly happened to him for what he would go on to to mm. do and yeah and also the fact that he had f he was one of four brothers mm. and still felt very much alone yeah but i guess that if you're the odd one out and maybe you're not into the same mm. sport maybe you don't have the same records ben you yeah. could be uh, isolated from them in that kind of way but yeah it, it, it's as we said this is coming from his own is his own story well here's something that didn't come from dennis at school dennis was said to have been an average to below average pupil he attended riverview elementary school and then went on to go to pleasant valley middle school at both of which he made very few friends um, he would also occasionally be found by teachers and classmates daydreaming in a trance-like state with one former schoolmate going on to say that dennis was completely unaware and had absolutely no sense of humor which I think seemed fairly mean. Yeah, apparently he just liked to talk about factual things. Yeah, which is which is which is fine. Yeah, everyone, you know, people like different things. Yeah, but there's no reason to say he had absolutely no sense of humour because maybe. then maybe he had something in the back pocket. Maybe sometimes. Yeah, occasionally. There was one particular occasion noted by Dennis at high school where one of his female teachers humiliated him in front of the entire class. And this was at a time when Dennis was caught in one of his trances. So he felt very annoyed, very angered by the fact that she'd called him out for kind of zoning out of the lesson. So to act out a form of revenge on this particular teacher, and bearing in mind he's in his early teens at this point, which is quite unnerving. After school, he later followed her back to her house in order to spy on her from a tree outside of her bedroom window, during which time he is said to have placed a rope around his neck, masturbated, and climaxed over her car. Obviously, a lot of questions there. Um, what car was it? No. Uh, but what what um, prompted him to do the, the rope around the neck? If you haven't got any previous... Yeah. I mean, obviously, a kink starts somewhere, but yeah, it's a lot of questions there. I mean, that reminds me of Ed Kemper going to his teacher's house with a rifle, didn't he? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, when, he, when he was young, but he didn't act on it. He just held the kind of was there he with was a rifle. Exercising his watch, demons. Yeah, and watching yeah. Her through the window. But like, yeah, that is just bizarre. So quite an escalation. Do you think the teacher thought it was bird shit? Possibly. And there's, no re there's no way we can rule that out. I don't think um, you would have thought, that's a student. <laughs> Some of my students can't. It looks like... <laughs> Dennis! <laughs> but she's not, that's not the first thing she's going to think of. Get that pigeon some fibre. What, pigeon's been eating pineapple. <laughs> Anyway, so we're going to go on to talk about some other elements of Dennis's childhood and yeah, some more alarm bells are going to be raised. As a youngster, Dennis joined the Boy Scouts and participated in various group activities within the local community via his local Lutheran church. It was during this time at the Boy Scouts that Dennis was introduced to the science or art. People have argued it both ways. Is it a science? Is it an art? I've never heard anyone argue that. Of knot tying. I'll produce it down. we tie the knot soon. Cheers. Dan Cheers, Dan Dennis. While we're here then, is it a science or is it an art? Not tying. I would say it's a science. Physics. But I've seen some pretty bows. Dan, will you take this one? <laughs> I've got nothing for yeah, you. Yeah, no. very, yeah, Sorry about that. That's fine. Anyway, he was really good at tying knots. So he was introduced to uh, knot tying. <laughs> yeah, forget it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he's introduced uh, uh, to knot tying, which he became exceptionally good at. So it's the first time in his life he's really excelled at something. Science. Th yeah, thank you, Dan. Tom? I, th I could not care less about oh. As with most children, Dennis was terrified by and had lots of nightmares about monsters. But interestingly, he also became aroused by the monsters. When experiencing repeated nightmares, he formed an intense attraction to these creatures. Do you know what kind of monsters they were, Ben? Were they vampires? I mean, or werewolves? <clears throat> He'll go on to blame, blame some demons. One of them was frog-like. Yeah, frog-like demon. There's not a lot out there on uh, Monsters, Tom. And if there was, I was too captivated by the argument of art versus science for bow tying. Not tying. For not tying. He also looks like he'd probably have Velcro shoes. BTK. Yep, I think that's, that's probably one of your better ones. And during the few occasions that he would bond with his mother, Dennis would often watch horror movies with Dorothy. 
Stop doing that, Dennis. However, this became problematic when he became aroused when a serial killer struck and he would retreat to his bedroom in order to relieve himself in the pairs of his mother's underwear. There's a lot of layers there, Ben. Yeah, well, if I can get us to the bedroom, which is, oh, this is really scary. I'm off. Oh, oh God, I'm so scared pulling down T-shirt. I'm really scared pulling down Play T-shirt. Play with a nipple. <laughs> there be people like different things. Yeah, exactly, right? yeah, yeah. It's BTK. I yeah. mean, it's not like. Oh, mum! Well, this one's a scary one, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but yeah, so then go in there, st- stole some knickers earlier on, take them. But there's his mum's. Is that part of it? Is that part of the perversion, or is it just the fact that they're women's? Mm. The relationship with his mother is a very interesting one, and there are some people that believe potentially he was sexually attracted to her. A complicated relationship with his mother. Yeah, safe to say. Norman Batesy. Oh, Master Batesy. <laughs> So though Dennis had a very detached relationship with both of his parents, if he was ever to misbehave or came home with a negative attitude or even arrived home late, he would be spanked by his father, William. Obviously, maybe a slight disciplinarian from his uh, Mm. marine days. On the occasions that this happened, Dennis would become aroused. So, I mean, there are a lot of things that will arouse this boy. Um, Being spanked by Willie is one of them. Absolutely. Dennis said that he would also become aroused when he saw chickens, pigs and cows being transported to slaughterhouses. His grandparents as well, you know, the grandpa next door with the old barber shop, Paul Hall, they had a chicken coop. Mm. And it's, again, widely believed that he would occasionally slaughter some of those chickens in front of a young Dennis, which could again... Make him make chicken soup. Exactly. In his pants. Yeah. So he's got a very active imagination. I don't know if either of you watched Bob's Burgers. Uh, I like the guy's voice. He's in Archer. Yeah. Bob. Um, I'm assuming it's Bob. I can't remember what her name is. It's one of the daughters. She dreams about um, getting with zombies. And that's what I was picturing when um, he said about dreaming about monsters. But yeah, it is. Even in cartoons is not too far fetched, is it? Jessica Rabbit as a kid. Okay, w- where are we now? So you're saying which, which cartoon she found attractive as a kid? Is that where we are? Well, no, I'm just saying that's not that's not Jessica weird. Rabbit, Miss Finster. Who else? Question for you guys. One character from The Simpsons. Mine's weird. Mine's weird. And actually, it's going to fuel your thing. Seymour's mum. Um, Miss Crabapple. That's mine. Crabapple. Can you elaborate on that? Why? I think she'd be fun. <laughs> but also, just to put some more distance between me and BTK. How um, are you? <laughs> just want a bit more distance, if that's all right. Sure. I get emotional when I drive past those cattle transporting vehicles. Whilst eating your beef burger. Well, hang on. Well, here's the thing. Every time I drive past those... What are they even called? Uh, cattle transporters? Slaughter vans? Slaughter van. Uh, I don't even know, Ben, to be so, honest. But you know what I'm talking about. So if I, there's two things here. Every time I drive past them, it immediately makes me you know, feel awful about eating meat. And also your veggie food always smells and tastes better. But then also, I don't know what's sadder, making eye contact with a full cattle transporting vehicle mm-hmm. or driving past an empty one. I see where you're going, yeah, with that. Because if it's full up, I know yeah, what's no, coming. Yeah, but they... Yeah, yeah. And if it's empty, I know what's happened. Yeah, well, it's just sad. Really sad. So you see the pigs in the little gaps, you know. Yeah. Mm. It's not nice. But and they're smarter than a lot. Of, a lot of people give them credit for. A lot of people, I was going to say. Oh. So we're in his teens, Tom. Obviously his childhood, very complex. A lot going on right now. It only gets darker. And quite quickly. Things will only get darker. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it's already a right patchwork quilt of a childhood. Mm. So during his early teenage years, Dennis would begin to trap, torture and kill, there's the T and the K, cats and dogs in his neighbourhood, as well as other small wild animals that he would find. He somehow manages to keep this newfound pleasure completely hidden from his family, the rest of the neighbourhood. So I imagine he's maybe popping into the woods or, Mm. you know, out of sight there. When he manages to find these animals, this is horrific. He would become extremely aroused by both the sheer panic and struggle that the animals would face, but then also become extremely aroused by the kill itself, which is just grim. It's just, do you think it's just power over these creatures? Or do you think, like, because he would hang them, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah, and watch them. I think it's a, there's a power thing, and I think a lot of things he's going to go on to do seem to be motivated by power and control. Mm. How do you first realise that that's something that does it for you? Yeah, it is. It obviously, it's just very disturbing. And yeah, as, you, as we mentioned now, he's realised that he likes to be tied up. He gets turned on by that and he gets turned on by cruelty. He gets turned on by things that are 
make you feel uneasy and unnerved like horror films or, or nightmares. So though the animal torture is absolutely horrific, it could be argued that this next moment could be the catalyst for the escalation of what Dennis would go on to do in later life. When he was young, Dennis's mother reached under the sofa to pick up something that had fallen behind the couch. When she did this, her wedding ring got caught on a couch spring and she couldn't get her hand out or move away from the couch. She was apparently absolutely terrified and told young Dennis to go and get help. It was at this time that he felt his first stirrings of arousal. It was exciting to him to see a woman being helpless and it was the beginning of his ideas about women that what he wanted from them was to keep them trapped and helpless and looking to him in terror. That became imprinted in his mind and became the image he was always after. There's a couple of things here. First of all, that's again something with his, with his mother. But there was also some information that Dennis shared about allegedly being tied up as a youngster by a group of older boys after he snuck on the premises of an abandoned barn that these older boys were all smoking in. And apparently once they got him, they started tying him up and he felt a huge sense of arousal as this happened. With the animals, he's, he's feeling aroused by the fact that they're helpless and defenceless and he, you know seeing that look of terror becomes attractive to him but again it's just he's going down all these different tangents mm. that all together are going to form the btk killer so as a teenager dennis started to harbor dark sexual fantasies about binding and torturing uh, trapped and helpless women actress annette finicello who played a mouseketeer on the original mickey mouse club tv show in the 1950s was one of his favorite targets for imaginary bondage a sign of the fact that he was still very much a child with the context of these dark thoughts still confused about his sexuality and having also not dated to this point dennis began experimenting with cross-dressing and autoerotic asphyxiation dennis would often spy on female neighbors whilst masturbating dressed head to toe in his mother's clothes or women's clothing they had stolen from neighbors he'd been spying on dennis would often masturbate with ropes belts ties straps and other bindings around his neck and arms that makes me think of that football supporter for for uh, by munich the scarf man <laughs> back in the days where i worked as a recruiter i was calling a candidate to confirm them for an interview i was due to interview them mm. it rang out a voicemail it's the most uncomfortable thing because i was so put out of joint by this voicemail basically her voicemail went hello i can't get to the phone right now i'm all tired up you know bondage and that Please leave a message and I'll call you back. And then I was like, oh, hi, uh, just hi, yeah. call in to confirm your interview. I'll see you tomorrow. She didn't get the job. <laughs> so Dennis is kind of into his voyeurism with the neighbourhood uh, women. He's attracted to victims and monsters in horror movies and nightmares. He's also heavily involved in torturing and killing wild animals. He also now becomes sexually excited when he reads books about murders, masturbating to his father's copy of a book about the Lonely Hearts killers, stating that after reading this book, he fantasized about tying women to train tracks, which is the most villainous act ever, of course, uh, especially in cartoons, uh, and masturbating over their corpses once the train had hit them. So that's more villainous. I would agree with you. As well as this, Dennis started cutting out female figures from various magazine advertisements on which he would start to draw ropes and gags over the women. He would then paste them into a collection of 3 by 5 index cards that he would carry around with him at all times. This is, in fact, referenced extremely well in one of the cold opens. For, well, it's not really a cold open. In one of the opening scenes of one of the Mindhunter episodes. But yeah, he's, he's drawing ropes around women's necks, gags in their mouth... And you have to think if maybe his, one of his teachers, brothers, parents found that, that would be raise a little bit of suspicion or is that just... I used to draw huh? monsters. Oh, okay. Uh, not with any of that stuff going on. And I used to draw... I mean, my friends would draw stick men and they'd, they'd fight. It's usually the Groucho Marx face on a newspaper, give him a little moustache and glasses. Or the classic, just a... Big... Yeah. Hat. Yeah, big, big old hat with some liquid coming out of the top of it. As a teenager, Dennis began to enjoy what he called trolling, which is very different to what we call it nowadays, uh, driving around certain neighbourhoods to observe women, stare at them and lust over them until he was asked to leave. I'd call that creeping. Though this is awful, it seems relatively tame compared to everything else he was up to. Dennis stalked women as they shopped alone in grocery stores. He developed fantasies of hiding in the backseat of their cars and kidnapping them at gunpoint. Obviously, that's quite a different type of trolling, but I could see him as an internet troll as well. He's got one of those faces. Yeah, he, he looks like a moody old man. Dennis attended Kansas Wesleyan University after graduating high school, but he struggled academically and would drop out after just one year of studying, having received poor grades. He then took a job in a local grocery store. Sorry, I thought this would be my part. Boom, told you he would look good in a co-op. 
<laughs> not look good. Not look good. Um, but you can't, you can't say told you if you've done the research and then done that bit afterwards. No, I put that bit in first and then I, you know, I did my opening kind of monologue. Um, <laughs> monologue. <laughs> Fuck it out. But interestingly, about this job in the local grocery store, you'd think a couple of parents that are grafters, workaholics, that were running the family, didn't. Yeah, Dennis would, wouldn't work his full hours every week. He'd try and work as little as possible. I mean, I would have thought he would be, because he would always troll, as he said. Yeah. That that's the place, because he was going to grocery stores anyway to troll on women, that he would have been happily yeah. just maybe... Well, every time he arrived for his shift, he sort of stretched as he walked in and went, oh, this raider should have stayed at home. Did he do that? It's a couple of times. Yeah. In the summer of 1966, at the age of 21, Dennis joined the US Air Force. Many have argued that Dennis probably joined the Air Force to avoid being drafted into the Vietnam War. And apparently, I was quite surprised by this, the US Army would draft individuals who had lower school grades into the Vietnam War, so Dennis knew that he would be at risk of being drafted. Quick Google will tell you that most of the men who were drafted for Vietnam went straight into the army. However, the Navy and Air Force would take drafted soldiers, but only after the correct training had been completed. But yeah, I, a lot of people said he was trying to be smart here, avoid getting drafted. That was his motivation behind joining the Air Force. While in the Air Force, Dennis would resume old habits and he would actually start to peek through the window blinds to watch local women undress. He would also break into their homes to steal their undergarments on several occasions. So, again... My mum has these. Dennis spent four years on active duty in the Air Force. Over the course of his tenure, he received the Air Force Good Conduct Medal. That sounds like Club Club Clubman Award. The Small Arms Expert Marksmanship Ribbon. Small Arms. Jordan Pickford. And the National Defence Service Medal. I mean, I'm not going to go into trying to see if they're good or not. I mean, we've got enough hot water last week with the sergeant bashing. Yeah, so. sorry about that. Dennis was discharged from the Air Force in 1970 at the rank of Staff Sergeant, so he quickly took a job working in the deli as well as the meat department at the supermarket that his mother was a bookkeeper at in Park City, Kansas. Dennis was subsequently moved to Park City as a result. So yeah, he's, he's getting all the different jobs in the... Mm. Uh, Butcher. In 1971, Dennis married Paula Dietz. Interestingly, they'd only been dating for for just under a year, and the couple would go on to have two children, a boy and a girl, Brian and Kerry. It seems as a result of his newfound role as a husband and family man, Dennis decided that he wanted to make something of his life and not just be working behind the deli. So he attended Butler Community College in El Dorado, earning an associate's degree in electronics. He then enrolled in Wichita State University and graduated in 1979 with a Bachelor of Science degree, majoring in administration of justice. Dennis would also go on to become a Cub Scout leader, as well as the president of his local church council. After graduating, Dennis initially worked as an assembler for the Coleman Company, which was an outdoor supply company, though he was made redundant from his role. He then worked as an installer at the ADT Security Services, a role that he would hold from 1974 to 1988. And we'll talk more about that shortly. So Dennis would slip deeper into the dark fantasy world that he had known since childhood and increasingly wanted to know what it would feel like to strangle a woman with his bare hands. He became obsessed with pornography and liked to daydream whilst at work. He also nicknamed his penis... Sparky. Later in life, Dennis became a dog catcher as well as a compliance officer in Park City. In both of these positions, neighbours and locals would recall him as being overzealous and extremely strict. And he also was said to have taken extreme pleasure in bullying and harassing single women. I've seen a couple of different um, witness statements about this. He would complain if people hadn't cut their grass to a certain length. Yeah, there was, there was strict policies in place, though, apparently. He, just, he was just very a stickler to the rules like that. Put his little... Measuring tape out. Yep, not sparky. And then he would also uh, shoot tranquilizer darts at dogs if yeah. they were on the leads. Excessive. Well, they, yeah, very, very excessive. Yeah. But... With one neighbour even complaining that Dennis killed her dog for absolutely no reason. So now we're going to go into the timeline for Dennis Raider. He's currently at this stage, he's working for the security company. He's very eager to know what it would feel like to feel a life drain in his hands. He's still having his, all of his dark fantasies. But now we're going to look at when he turned into the BTK killer. January 15th, 1974. Joseph Otero and his wife Julie were in their home along with two of their children, Josephine, aged 11, and Joseph, aged 9. Raider had been watching the Otero family for many days. He had attempted to enter their home through the back door after cutting the phone lines. However, the Otero family dog, Lucky, began to bark. He then retreated. Raider then made a second attempt, at which point nine-year-old Joseph opened the door and let Raider into the house. 
He then found the four members of the Otero family and pulled out a pistol. At gunpoint, he took the family into the living room, but decided it would work better for him to tie them up in the bedroom, so he began to move them upstairs. At this point, Raider was living out a fantasy, having carefully stalked and selected them. So whilst moving the family to the upstairs bedroom, Raider becomes agitated when the dog Lucky doesn't stop barking. He then instructs the family to put the dog outside, and Mr. Otero instructs his youngest son, Joseph, to take the dog outside. Mr. Otero tried to reason with Raider, offering him his car and money. Raider then realised that he had not been wearing a mask and that the family could ID him. So he decided he had to kill them, not just fulfil his sexual fantasies. And this is the thing, you don't know at this point if he's going in there knowing he's going to wipe out a family mm. or if he's just going into you know maybe he, well i assume with the amount of time he spent watching them he knew that it was a full house that's the thing i was thinking then yeah if he's been stalking it and for as long as he said he has he must he must know it's not a case of a couple of the other ones you could possibly argue yeah that he didn't know but this one you, you can't help but feel he must have done yeah because yeah. He, he, yeah and his first victims as well not just one lone vulnerable victim it's a whole family as we said, Mr. Otero, he tried to reason. Um, he was actually recovering from a recent car accident, so he had several broken ribs. He was pleading with him to let his, his wife and his children go. But obviously at the point of realizing he could be positively ID'd by them, Raider decides to kill them. Raider proceeded to tie a plastic bag over Joseph Otero's head with some cords and tighten them, suffocating him. Raider would also place a cushion below Joseph due to the fact that he had recently been in a car crash and had broken ribs that were still healing. So basically Mr. Otero had indicated he was in some pain with the fact that Raider had made him lay stomach down on the floor and interestingly Raider goes and gets a little cushion for him to try and yeah. make him more comfortable. Considering whilst... he likes people to be in pain and be yeah. helpless, you would have thought that would be... And th yeah, and again there are some actions that will confuse you in what he decides to do when people are in pain and, and at his mercy. Mm. Mr. Otero didn't die right away, so Raider moved on to his wife, Julie Otero. He strangled her, but not having strangled anyone before, she passed out but didn't die, and Raider obviously assumed that he'd also killed her. Thinking she was dead, Raider then moved on to the children, and whilst suffocating their daughter, Mr. and Mrs. Otero regained consciousness. Raider, as a result, would retie their head ties and completely suffocated both of them. He would then go on to put two bags and a t-shirt over the son Joseph's head in order to suffocate him, having learned from his mistakes, almost on the spot as well, mm. that he had acted with the parents. Basically, there's a pattern that emerges here. He, Because he's only really practiced on animals, he's mm. not realized the strength and time that it takes to kill a human. Both the mother and father, as well as the daughter, Raider has strangled, thinking he's killed them, but he's only applied enough pressure or presented enough oxygen for them to all pass out. Mr. Otero came back around, Julie Otero came back around, and also Josephine, the daughter, came back around. Once he'd confirmed that both the parents were dead, he then took Josephine, his primary target into the cellar where he tied her to a pipe and hung her till she died. He then masturbated, having become aroused at his kill. So Raider took pictures of the dead bodies and gathered up some of the 11 year old Josephine's underwear as a memento of his first completed project. I mean, you have to say as well, with the fact that he was doing all this research and whatnot and for years upon years practicing on animals, mm. to wipe out a whole family essentially seems very bold and yeah he obviously was quite bumbling with how he done it and considering obviously there were failed attempts constantly throughout the whole time so raider then went through the house and completed what he called the right hand rule in which he cleaned up the place by taking various items from the house such as joseph otero's watch he walked out the front door having taken the otero's car keys earlier in the day and drove over to where he had parked his car got into his own car and drove away. So one thing as well that I read about this particular set of murders is he developed an obsession with true crime, serial killer movies, mm. uh, his father's detective books. One thing that he did here, he manipulated the scene to make things look different to the events that had actually happened, but he also turned all of the heating appliances on so that the temperature in the house would raise. He closed mm. all the windows so that it would appear that the bodies were killed at a different time to when they actually were killed. Oh. He believed that he could manipulate the kind of, because this is before DNA. Mm. He wanted the bodies to be warmer so it felt like a fresher kill once yeah. they were discovered. Jesus. 
So the terror's 15-year-old son, Charlie, would return home. He'd see Lucky outside the house, which was very unusual, that the family dog, and immediately knew something was wrong. He went into the house and saw his mum's handbag on the, on the stove with all the, all the contents poured out. Again, you know, straight away, what's going on here? He was greeted by his two, two younger siblings who said the haunting thing of mum and dad are playing a, a, a mean joke. Yeah. And then he went to go upstairs and immediately found his parents and he knew that both of them had been killed. He, yeah. he put his hand on them and they were cold and he knew they weren't playing a joke and in fact they, they, had, they had passed on. But you can only imagine a 15-year-old walking in, I mean, and the younger siblings as well, walking in and finding the scenes. He, he didn't find his younger sister, and he said, that's one thing I'm grateful for, I didn't go downstairs and, and find her. You can only imagine that scene. Absolutely horrific. As Tom mentioned, this is his first murder, that first escalation. He's also, although he went armed with a gun, he's not had to use it mm. apart from the threats that he was making with it. He's essentially killed all four of them with his bare hands. Like we always go on about escalations. Mm -hmm. That is a big escalation, isn't it? April 4th, 1974, Raider had been driving around Sedwick County, Kansas, looking for his next target when he spotted Catherine Bright go into her house. He had been in his stalking phase and was actively looking for his next victim. He would go on to refer to Catherine as a sweet kid who he had trolled for many times, calling her Project Lights Out. Again, all of his victims he'd refer to as a, a project. Very much dehumanising them with those names as well. Raider broke into Catherine's house and waited for her near the bedroom. At around 2pm, Catherine and Kevin Bright, Catherine's brother, entered the house. Raider had not anticipated Kevin's arrival with Catherine. He'd mentioned again that he was hidden around the corner, but when he, the moment he heard two different voices, he was very kind of, right, okay, very alerted by that, and it hadn't gone to plan for him. At that stage, it was around the corner chocolates made, because he was cacking his pants. Raider came rushing at them with a gun and told them he was wanted in California and needed a car and money, forcing the Brights into the bedroom and making Kevin tie up his sister. Very reminiscent of the Zodiac. Yeah. He took Kevin into another room and tried tying him up but failed. Kevin wrestled with Raider and attempted to take the gun from him, but Raider had a good hold on the gun and shot Kevin in the head, assuming that he had killed him. He began to strangle Catherine, but her ties became loose and she began to struggle with Raider, which surprised him. Whilst the pair were fighting, Raider could hear a noise from the other room, went back in and found that Kevin, despite having been shot in the head, had regained consciousness. So Raider shoots him once again. Raider then found a knife and stabbed Catherine multiple times in the side, at which point he was able to overpower her. Whilst this was happening, Kevin managed to escape. So he's been shot twice in the head at this point, and he still manages to escape, which is an absolute miracle here. But sadly, his sister had met a much worse fate. And from the bedroom, Raider heard the back door open, and Kevin had, had started running down the street. He ran a few blocks to his car in search for help. He approached two men, one of whom took him to a hospital, and the other called the police. You can imagine what kind of sight that would be. Yeah. So Raider had attempted to chase um, Kevin to stop him from, from escaping, but he wasn't able to. He then returns to the house, quickly cleans up the mess, and attempts to steal Kevin. Catherine's car, but even though he had the keys, he couldn't get it started. He ran four blocks to Wichita State University campus where his car was parked and he drove off. Even after multiple emergency surgeries and blood transfusions, Catherine Bright died at the hospital. Her brother Kevin was in critical condition but did survive. With this obviously very different and a different, completely different scene to how he, how he killed the Ateros, he was on purpose done this to make his MO slightly different. And because of this, the police didn't actually link this to the same killing whatsoever. They, they couldn't see a pattern there at all. Kevin didn't learn about his sister's death until two days later. So sad. I mean, all of these killings are absolutely brutal and, and the surviving witnesses have been through endless amounts of trauma with this case. It's, it's particularly sad. So obviously he'd used a knife and a gun um, on the attacks on the Brights, the brother and sister. And interestingly, around this same time, three local men came forward to take responsibility for the Otero family murders. Under any other circumstance, he would view that as he's got away with mm. the Otero murders. He's changed his MO for his second set of attempted murders and a murder. However, very interestingly, once Raider learns of three other local men trying to take responsibility for his work, for his projects, he reacts a little bit differently to perhaps what other people would do so he is very angry at the fact someone's trying to claim credit and he wants to immediately prove that it, they had nothing to do with it so in october of 1974 an editor at the wichita eagle beacon receives a phone call that directs him to a mechanical engineering book which is in the wichita public library 
Police find the book and a letter inside which is typewritten and also filled with grammatical errors, which reads, Those three dude you have in custody are just talking to get publicity. The code words for me will be, Bind them, torture them, kill them. B, T, K. You see he at it again. They will be on the next victim. The letter also includes previously unreleased details of the Otero family killings, a majority of which the police believe only the killer himself would have known. The letter is filled with misspellings and grammatical errors, along with a distinct, sexually suggestive signature that becomes synonymous with the BTK killings. BTK is bind, torture, kill. Yeah, the things he was describing was essentially kind of how he positioned the bodies and things like what they're wearing and things like that, which people wouldn't have known. So yeah, they, they were like, it's always odd when people claim a, a murder they didn't do. Yeah, fascinating series, confession tapes mm. on Netflix. But that's when people that's are, more when they're coerced into yeah. it, isn't it? Manipulated into it. Yeah, it's it's, it's an odd one, but um, yeah, it got him to come forward because yeah, he was so so proud of what he had done. With all Raiders kind of misspellings and incorrect grammar, it suggested that the writing style was to ruse to conceal his intelligence. As a child, he had pretty low grades, but he's gone on to achieve a fair amount in his adult life. Mm. It could be viewed as either way. The 17th of March, 1977, naming this project Project Green, Raider went on the hunt for his next victim. He parked in a stall car park and approached a residence over the road. He knocked on the door, but no one was in. He recognised the neighbourhood and began walking through, trying houses with no luck. So he sees a young boy in the street and uh, Raider approaches him. He shows a picture of his his wife and, and children to this child and asks if the kid knows them. And then the, the boy, young boy didn't. The young boy was actually just returning from the shop because his mum was ill. He went to go buy some soup. Raider introduced himself as a policeman to the child and the child said he didn't know who the people were and he, he walked off. Shortly afterwards, uh, obviously a, ra- a Raider known where the, the young boy lived, he knocked on the door again saying not for them not to worry, he's a policeman. The boy and his two siblings answered the door and they let him in. So Raider walks into the house confidently, he starts shutting the blinds and, shut- and making sure no one could see anything. That scene itself is f- fucking terrifying. Yeah. A raider would turn off the um, TV where the kids were watching, and then he pulled his gun out. And once he did this, one of the kids would let, let out a scream. At this point, um, the 24-year-old mum, Shirley, then came out of the bedroom, startled, obviously seeing this man in, in a living room, not knowing what was going on. She, she obviously was very startled to see a man in a living room that she didn't recognise with her young children, with a gun. Uh, she was in a nightgown, and Raider assumed that she had been ill. So Raider said to her that he had done this before. He had some sexual fantasies and asked her if she was going to cooperate. And essentially, uh, Raider put the children into the bathroom. He got Shirley to push one of the beds in front of the door to barricade them in. He said to Shirley, if you cooperate, you won't come to any harm and even with the children. And he basically was trying to live out his fantasy he was trying to make, make it seem like she was safe and you know it, you know, this was all be over soon he also made a chilling statement to the children where if they didn't stop shouting he was going to shoot them so you can imagine how petrified they are they're in the bathroom they know the mum's in the other room with a man with a gun if they make any noise they're going to be shot so he ties Shirley up and as we mentioned Shirley was sick and she actually she was sick on the floor he got her a glass of water and, and comforted her which is very it's just such a weird yeah Shirley believed he was going to rape her and not harm the children, but he tied her up with a cord around her neck and strangled her to death. In one of the documentaries I saw, one of the children actually saw through the gap of the door because it wasn't quite barricaded. So the kid actually saw his mum and being strangled to death, which is absolutely horrifying. This is, I know we talked about him being obsessed with horror movies, but some of these scenes are straight out of a horror movie. Absolutely hideous. Definitely, and you can kind of see, obviously it would affect you in this guy. You can see that his life has just been derailed massively by by obviously witnessing that. Although there were no signs of sexual assault, he left semen on her underwear, which were found next to her body. So shortly after Raider had killed Shirley, the phone began to ring. So he quickly cleaned up, cleaned up the sick, cleaned up any, tried to clear up any evidence, but he left the semen stained underwear and he made a run basically because he knew that if, if no one had answered the phone that would be you know suspicious anyway and people would come around and check what was going on the children luckily managed to escape via the bathroom window December 8th 1977 Raider had been stalking 25 year old Nancy Fox for some time and that that's the horrible thing about this crime he's already kind of picking out his projects mm. whilst already then going on and committing other murders so he's got other people in the in the back of his mind that fit that kind of MO or that kind of profile of victims though they range quite a bit. He cut the telephone lines and broke into Nancy's home and waited for her to get back from her job at a local jewellery store. When she arrived home, Raider was waiting in her kitchen. He immediately held her at gunpoint and he told her that he had sexual fantasies and that he needed to rape her in order to fulfil them. 
He then smoked a cigarette with her and she apparently said, let's get this over with so I can call the police. A lot of this is through his words, which he will go on to how he just sinks like a canary in the courtroom um, about all these things in very much detail. But yeah, you do think some of these lines and stuff like that, he's just worded them in such a way which is very cinematic. Nancy was allowed to partially undress herself in the bathroom before Raider tied her up. He then handcuffed her and tied her to the bed. He undressed himself and began to strangle her with his belt, revealing her his crimes and who he really was whilst he was killing her slowly. He then removed the handcuffs and belt and retied her with some pantyhose. He then masturbated. His semen was found on the nightgown next to her body. In every crime scene now, he's whether this is intentional or not, he's left his semen. I think for quite a thorough person, which he seems to be with tidying up, I think it is. Is it a dominance thing, a territory thing? It, which is a, disgusting, but... It's like it's not like a calling card. Sticky bandit. Raider then left through the front door after having cleaned up. As he went through the various rooms of the house, he actually took some of Nancy's personal items with him. The following day, on his way to work, Raider called the local police department and said, I'd like to report a homicide. Yes, you will find a homicide. And he, there was a distinct way that he said homicide as well. It was like, homicide, homicide. At 843 South Pershing, Nancy Fox. That is correct. And there's audio of this, but it's a really, really crackly line. Mm. The answerer actually asks him to repeat certain elements of it. And he just, he, his tone doesn't change whatsoever. He then left the receiver of the phone dangling. At the time as well, the police were working on new technology to be able to trace and track phone calls. So they were actually within five minutes able to get to that scene. The police then rushed to the address that Raider had given them at 843 South Pershing and found Nancy's body. The police tried to replay the recording of his voice many times, but never found a match. And they also were able to track the location of the call However, when they got to the phone box, and again, whether this is just a cinematic retelling, the phone was just dangling off the receiver. Uh, so they'd missed Raider by a couple of minutes. Raider claimed to have once dropped by her mailbox to check what her name was during the trolling stage of his crime. So he was kind of familiarizing himself with his victim um, at that stage. January 1978, Raider sent a poem called Shirley Locks to the Wichita Eagle newspaper. It was printed on an index card and began with Shirley Locks, Shirley Locks, Wilt thou be mine? Unaware of the connection to Shirley Vianne and believing it to be a Valentine's Day note, the mail clerk forwards the card to the paper's classified department. So again, kind of Zodiac vibes. Yeah, definitely. He's ta inspired. taunting, he's wanting credit. I mean, obviously it's, it's to live out his sexual fantasies, but he's, he's developing a pattern of how he does things. Cut the phone line, obviously buying torture kill, but leaving the bodies in certain ways. And he's also mm. taking photos of the bodies and positioning them in certain ways and taking mementos as well. The 10th of February 1978, a letter from BTK was sent to KAKE TV, claiming responsibility for the deaths of Shirley Vianne and Nancy Fox, as well as another unnamed victim. Apparently angered by the lack of response to his last attempt at contacting the media, the killer makes this message more direct. He says, How many people do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper or some national attention? It began before reading off a list of suggested nicknames, including the BTK Strangler, the Wichita Hangman, and the Asphyxiator. The letter was also mocking the murder of Nancy Fox, entitled, Oh Death to Nancy, which was mimicking the song, Oh Death. Police Chief Richard Lemonion finally announces to the public that a serial killer named BTK is at large in the area and has threatened to strike again. So this is, he's four years into his killing spree now, he's got six victims and he's now finally starting to get a little bit of media attention and I can imagine him loving this now, mm. absolutely loving this, living his second life with his, with his family but he's going to get more confident by the year now. That's the thing to, have, to touch on some documentaries I've seen which you know we actually have his daughter talking about him at home. He was a family man, you know, he worked, he, he was very religious, he'd go to the church every Sunday, he you know, worked with the Boy Scouts as well, he spent a lot of time apparently, he, he liked to get things done right, he's very particular how he did things, apparently the kids knew not to sit on his chair or not to touch his things in the house. But outside, he was very outdoorsy. The daughter said he was he was her best friend. They'd go on nice walks. He would teach her about stuff. You know, he was a good dad, by all accounts, from what they could see. Uh, one of the haunting things was he used to have that stress ball, which said, um, life is good on it, I believe, which he used to squeeze and apparently to strengthen up his hands to help oh. him with strangling. Yeah, it's, it's a menacing sight. You can still buy those stress balls online. The juxtaposition between his family life and you know his professional life mm -hmm. and then to the btk yeah people they just couldn't believe it imagine your favorite neighbor 
I mean, he might not have been many people's favourite neighbour, but if you get your favourite neighbour in your mind right now, and then that person is actually a serial killer. That's so, up. That's up. It's a tricky thought to, to handle. April 28th, 1979. Raider waits inside a home he has carefully stalked, but leaves before 63-year-old Anna Williams returns. Again, I hate that we keep referencing Mindhunter. It's an amazing series. But this, again, is portrayed incredibly well um, in that series. He's in the house for hours, expecting her to arrive at a certain time. Little did he know that she'd stayed late one particular night after work. So less than two months later, Williams receives several of her personal items by mail, along with a poem titled, Oh Anna, Why Didn't You Appear? Which is just creepy yeah, beyond belief. Creepy. So he's waited in there for a number of hours. He's hiding away in the dark, waiting for that front door to open. It never happens. He gets impatient and he decides to leave. August 14th, 1979, police broadcast the telephone call from Raider reporting the death of Nancy Fox. As a result of this, police get more than 100 tips in the first day of radio and TV broadcasts. April 27th, 1985, Raider was in the middle of a Boy Scout meeting when he stated that he had a headache and needed to leave in order to get medication. When in actual fact he didn't have a headache, he was looking to create an alibi for what he would later go on to do. So as a result of this, he he left and went to a nearby bar where he ordered one beer, swished it around in his mouth for a little bit, intentionally spilt some on his clothes and then spat the beer out. He wanted to give the illusion that he'd spent the whole night drinking and was drunk. He then called a cab pretending to be drunk and told the driver to take him to Park City. So he was really playing the drunken fool here. He'd stumble out into the taxi cab to make the taxi driver believe he'd been there for hours and hours just slamming the beers back. When in fact, after the taxi driver dropped him off in Park City, Raider would break into his neighbour, Marine Hedges home. The 53-year-old wasn't at home, so Raider followed his usual pattern of cutting the phone lines and lying in wait. He saw Marine finally arrive home, however this time she was with a male friend, so he waited in her bedroom closet. At 1am, once the man had left and Marine was asleep, Raider came out of hiding, turned on the bathroom light and jumped on top of Marine, choking her to death. Once she had died, he dragged her body outside into the trunk of her car. He drove to the church that he went to regularly, and because he was a trusted member, he had keys to the building. He dragged her to the basement of the church, photographed the body before putting her back into his car and dumping her body on a dirt track not far from where they both lived. This one, extremely close to home, it's his neighbour, but he's gone completely against his usual MO here. He's taken the body with him. Mm. He's manipulated a witness in this potential taxi driver witness to appear drunk. Uh, he got an alibi, didn't he? So yeah, the one thing to note there is that seven years gap between the killings. Obviously, he said the police will be another one again. So it's believed that actually just being a dad got in the way of what he wanted to do. He had to spend time with his family. He didn't find time to go out and do those things. He obviously had to provide for his family and stuff. So it wasn't a case of he was teasing them and going away for seven years. Yeah, yeah. He did, he did find ways to kind of sate that lust he needed for the binding, which would, he would go on to Boy Scout trips when the, when the children were asleep. He would go out and he would tie himself up, dress up in women's clothes, take pictures of himself. Yeah. Um, he would even dig shallow graves and lay in them, all bound up with, with a mask on. And, you know, it, it's very, very creepy the stuff he used to do but that was enough for him at that time to kind of sate that hunger he needed uh, as the scouts went to bed he'd wander off into the woods and it, as Tom said he would tie himself up he'd take a female faced mask mm. tie himself up and, and bind himself against trees while he would masturbate there's one particular occasion and again I don't know why he would admit this unless it happened because he doesn't come out of it looking too cool but he would tie himself accidentally far too tight and he was really worried that actually uh, he had rope around his neck, woman's mask on, woman's underwear, tied to a tree, and he couldn't get out. Mm. So he freaked out big time that he would be found. What's he going to say if someone finds him like that? Stag do. Immediately. You knew straight away how to Just handle to that sort of thing. Think on my feet. How did he get out of it? So he would struggle for hours, slowly undo the knot and, and release himself, but it made him much more careful moving forward about the type oh. of knots that he would tie on himself. The other thing that's horrible about that as well is he's hiding in Marine's closet. Mm -hmm. She brings a male friend home with her. And this goes back to all of the stalking and trolling that he enjoyed doing. He's in there for hours just watching. 
that's probably part of it, isn't it? It's the anticipation. That's the first killing he'd, he'd done in seven years. Yeah. So he was obviously very keen. And like a strange MO, considering it's, it's someone next door, essentially. Yeah, well, they've been living together 30 years on the same block. Yeah. And uh, the daughter recalls them walking past and saying hello to her. She was very friendly. Yeah, it's just, it's very, very odd. So Maureen is found dead by strangulation eight days later, though police fail to connect her to the BTK murderer at the time. So the 16th of September 1986, Raider had identified his next victim, mother of two, 28-year-old Vicky Wagerly. Raider dresses the telephone repairman and Vicky let him inside her home after he claimed he was there to fix her telephone line. So he's been detective, mm-hmm. drunk man coming home from the pub, telephone repairman. That's though, isn't it? Well, different character, isn't it? He's played that character quite well. Fugitive on the run. That's, I've given you four there. What's your point, though? He's able to wear all these different hats. and He's alternating it each time he finds his next victim, which is fascinating. At gunpoint, he forced her into the bedroom and tried to tie her up, but she fought back, causing cuts and scratches on Raider. He got a rope and stopped her fighting by choking her to death. He then took photos of the body in different positions and left, stealing her car. So soon after this happened, uh, Vicky's husband Bill was driving back home and he thought he saw Vicky's car drive in the opposite direction, but he didn't recognise the driver. He rushed home and found his two-year-old son by himself in the living room. He searched the house for his wife and soon found her on the floor behind the bed in the bedroom. Vicky was rushed to hospital but was pronounced dead soon after arrival. At the time, this wasn't linked to the BTK, and Bill became the prime suspect in Vicky's murder. So as we mentioned earlier, Raider named each kind of these projects, and this one's called Project Piano, and because I, I believe he overheard, he was sitting on a bench one day, he overheard piano coming from a household, and he clocked it was their house, and that was the reason that kind of it made him decide that she was going to be his next project. Yeah, didn't he also have an obsession with certain numbers? So if houses ended in like the number three or the number eight he would be more inclined to to take victims from those he had a thing about numbers as well really random really bizarre but that's a horrible little light listening to her playing january 19th 1991 on a weekend that raider was supposed to be going camping with the boy scouts he came up with an excuse and slipped away from a meeting he drove his car to his parents house to change out of his scout uniform and into his hit clothes he would call these his hit clothes he also had hit kits in which he would have various ropes and bonds and, and weapons he continued on to the home of 62 year old dolores davis dolores was in her house so raider waited until he saw that she was asleep he broke the glass door at the back of the house with a cement block that he had found dolores woke up and came out of her bedroom startled and found raider like the many times before, he told her that he needed money, a car, food, and that he was going to tie her up. He tied her up and even went as far as to pretend to search the house for money, make food, and gather personal items of her that could be valuable. He then returned and strangled her to death with a pair of pantyhose. Raider took the body outside and put her in her own car. He drove to a lake near Park City and hid the body. He then hid the evidence, such as clothes and a gun, under some trees. He drove the car back to the Davis house, wiped it down for fingerprints, left the car and then went somewhere to change back into his scout uniform and then calmly returned back to the camp. So even then, this is obviously we've mentioned before, before DNA testing, before DNA evidence, he's still so, so careful at all these different crime scenes and then calmly rocks back to camp. He's very meticulous in tidying up, but he would leave DNA there. Uh, obviously, we, 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 he masturbating over their items. The other thing about this one was that stuck out for me is the body had the mask on it, or the mask was near the body yes. on the floor, which yeah. is the same mask that he would wear when he was dressing up and in pictures, which is yeah, it's very disturbing. It's so weird as well. The, he knows when he breaks into the house that he's going to kill her, but he still gives her that sense of calmness to pretend like he's going and oh, I'll get some valuables, I'll eat a sandwich. Do you think that, that is that him? Still um, trying to make his mind up, maybe? No, I think he's trying to disassociate from the scenes by pretending his character that is going to do those things, perhaps. Or is it a case of he doesn't want them to be immediately scared, he wants to see their eyes as soon as they realise that they are going to be killed? It's really weird. So the first, Mr Otero, broken ribs, in a lot of pain, laying on his stomach, goes and gets him a cushion. Third victim, very, very unwell, is sick when he tries to uh, bind her, goes and gets her a glass of water, cleans up, comforts her. Fourth or fifth victim, he sits and has, and again, this is all his version of events, but he sits and has a cigarette, calmly has a cigarette mm. with her. And now here, he's, you know, making it look like, you know, I'm only going to take your money and some food and get get a few items. I do think it's probably that. I think it's a case of they don't know they're going to be killed until the rope's around the neck. And then he's, that's probably what he gets off on, which is absolutely 
horrific. The following evening, he went back to where he'd left Dolores' body and took photographs of it. So the murder of Dolores uh, obviously took place in 1991. So this is now three different decades that he has claimed a victim within. This makes it the longest spree killing, doesn't it, in regards to the, from the first death to the last death, and he's, he's still at large. So March 2004, three decades after Raider first killed the Ateros, the Wichita Eagle prints an article recalling the terror BTK wielded in the 1970s, suggesting that he had faded from memory after so many years. Soon, which is an odd thing to do, but I guess they're, are, they, are they trying to... Because oh, they, they, they thought perhaps, I mean, this is 2004, the last kill he'd done was 13 years ago. So it's a weird time to start baiting him. Maybe he's passed away. Maybe they think That's, he's... Yeah, they, yeah. Think, they think he might be in prison already. They think he might have died. But yeah, they're kind of recalling like, the Wichita like, kind of boogeyman at that time. It's like they weren't worried. You know, everyone was scared of this BTK killer. It must have rattled him. Yeah, it did, Ben. So soon after, a letter arrives at the Wichita Eagle containing a photocopy of Vicky Wigurley's driver's license and a photo of her body. Police link it to BTK. Raider admits that this article spurred him to revive his alter ego. Raider then begins the series of 11 communications from BTK. So May 2004, a word puzzle was received by KAKE TV, spilling out clues like Prowl and Fantasies, though investigators note the lack of his usual signature. People will later realise the letters spelling Raider are grouped around the numbers 6220, the author's street address. Oh, that's so fucking arrogant. In June, a package was found taped to a stop sign in Wichita containing graphic descriptions of the Otero murders. So he's trying to, after all this time, trying to you know, lay claim to all these killings, trying to put them all under the BTK handle as well, make everyone still you know, afraid the fact that he's still out there. So on February 16th, 2005, a very, very infamous uh, moment of this particular case. So Radar, after consulting the local police department, ends up sending a floppy disk to Fox TV station and KSAS in Wichita. Forensic analysis quickly determined that the disc had been used by the Christ Lutheran Church in Wichita. They also find that the document was last edited by someone of the name Dennis. An internet search determined quickly that Dennis Rader was the president of this church. So going on that, so basically this was a big, huge mistake from Rader. He'd been writing letters to the police department and he basically asked them outright, if I give you a floppy disk or give you information on the floppy disk, are you going to be able to trace me from it? He basically got them to reply to his letter by an ad in a paper. I think they had to put a certain number on it for him to notice to them. And it said, Dennis, don't worry or something like that. You don't need to, you don't need to worry. As in, we're not going to be able to track you from it. So he believed them and the police couldn't believe their luck. And they, yeah, they began to survey a radar after, the, after this point and, and find out all their information. So if he just didn't, go for the bait and want the fame but he would never have got caught absolutely absolutely and it's scary to think if there are any dennis raiders out there that haven't yet been caught there must be serial killers out there that still haven't been caught yeah and it's his own arrogance that has been his downfall so as tom mentioned police immediately begin surveillance of raider sometime during this period police obtained a warrant for the medical records of raider's daughter kerry a tissue sample was seized from her smear test and was tested for dna and provided a familial match with semen at an earlier btk crime scene this along with other evidence gathered prior to and during the surveillance gave police probable cause for an arrest so Vicky Wigurley, um, she actually had some of uh, BTK's DNA under her fingernails from scratching and fighting him off. So even though it didn't save her life, it in fact was vital evidence going forward that it was the BTK. I mean, his daughter, Kerry, I've seen her being interviewed on a few different things. And I feel sorry for she's the absolute spitting image of, does, of her father. Yeah. It's something you can never escape. I remember hearing of one of the policemen who was, who was going to go to the house beforehand before they had obtained this extra evidence against him. They'd seen the car and they realised that his car, they've seen it from surveillance, they're like, this is the person, I'm going to go in. And then he got a phone call saying, turn around, we haven't got enough evidence. Yeah, they were they were so, so... Obviously, he'd been making a, a mockery of the police force and taunting them for all those years. Mm. They knew they had their guy. It was everything but the actual warrant that they had. And so they were pumped to get him, but yeah. they couldn't. So the 25th of February, 2005, whilst heading home from the office to have lunch with his wife, Raider is pulled over by the line of police cars trailing him and taking him into custody. So apparently this, when this stage when the police pulled him over, he said, can you let my wife know I won't be home for lunch? I assume you know where I live. <laughs> Which is quite the quote. He confesses after being confronted with the DNA evidence. There's, there's a footage of this where he basically, they, they say, say who you are. 
and he, he admits he's the BTK killer. And then he would go on to talk to his law enforcement and he would talk to them for hours about the crimes he committed. And a lot of people say that obviously this is the first time he could actually come clean to anyone about what he's done. Obviously he's been very braggy and very smug the whole time with them in terms of writing them letters and stuff. Mm -hmm. But this, this is the actual only time he can actually confess to people and discuss it in great length. Because even before they'd got him to the station, the, no, he made another interesting comment when they put him into the car. They said, Mr. Raider, do you know why you're going downtown? And he replied, oh, I have suspicions why. They filled up 12 DVDs with his confession. Apparently he was quite pissed off about the floppy disk. Because he was like, you would be. He's he like, he like, you lied to me. It's like, yes, we have literally been trying to find you for decades. He's like, oh, you didn't play fair. So, nah. So Raider's home and vehicle were searched and evidence, including computer equipment, a pair of black pantyhose retrieved from a shed and a container was collected. The following day, the Wichita Police Department announced that they were holding Dennis Lynn Raider as the prime suspect in the BTK killings in a press conference. Chief Norman Williams states, the bottom line is that the BTK has been arrested. And that's the bottom line because Norman Williams says so. It works. You, you were a big stone cold guy. I thought you'd like that. I like it when they're not forced. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> After his arrest, Raider stated he chose to resurface in 2004 for various reasons, including the release of the book Nightmare in Wichita, The Hunt for the BTK Strangler by Robert Beatty, and he wanted the opportunity to tell his own story in his own way. He also said that he was bored because his children had grown up and he had more time on his hands. In the courtroom, you see him in there, and there's a thing, about a 50 minute video of him yeah. talking about through all the things he'd done, and he's talking in such a He's putting a show on, isn't he? But it's weird because he says it in such a monotone voice with no emotion. But then later on when he when he does he does a little speech at the end to try and like apologise, he crocodile tears going on mm. and the family's actually all just all walked out, didn't they? He corrects the judge a couple of times. He keeps conferring with his lawyer, even he, though he's given away so much. When he corrects the judge, I've got real big vibes of the IT guy from the office. Oh. Don't you mean da 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 da? But you said <laughs> <laughs> pulled over and said, What were you worried about? My wife not know where I'm for lunch. On the 1st of March 2005, Dennis Rader was formally charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder. He made his first appearance via video conference from jail. He was represented by a public defender. Bail was continued at $10 million. May the 3rd, 2005, District Court Judge Gregory Waller entered not guilty pleas to the 10 charges on Raider's behalf, as Raider refused to speak at his arraignment. On the 27th of June 2005, Dennis Raider pleads guilty to 10 counts, giving a graphic account of his crimes in court. It's all on YouTube, 45, 50 minutes long. He made no apologies, and during his accounts he used personal jargon for his killing equipment. Raider casually described his victims as his projects and at one point likened the murders of his victims to killing animals by saying that he put them down. Absolutely horrific. I mean, it's fascinating watching. The still as well for the thumbnail, he just... Yeah, we'll go into his lookalikes later, but... Yeah. Mm. The 27th of July 2005, Sigrid County District Judge Eric Yost waived the usual 60-day waiting period and granted an immediate divorce for Paula Raider, agreeing that her mental health was in danger. Raider didn't contest the divorce. Paula Raider said in her divorce petition that her mental and physical condition had been adversely affected by the marriage. August 18th, 2005. During Raider's sentencing, the victim's families made statements, followed by Raider, who now apologised for the crimes. He was sentenced to 10 consecutive life terms, which requires a minimum of 175 years without a chance of parole. Kansas had no death penalty at the time of the killings were committed, so this was the maximum possible sentence. So that was the timeline for Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. We're now going to throw to our resident doctor, Dr. Das of a Psych for Sore Minds, for his clinical evaluation of Dennis Rader. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and I act as an expert witness in criminal trials. I'm also the host of a YouTube channel called A Psych for Sore Minds. So what is my psychoanalysis of BTK? Undoubtedly, one of the most unique and interesting aspects of his case is that he takes these souvenirs from his victims. And also, I think this is connected, semen has been found at the scene, even though none of his victims were sexually assaulted. And also he photographed at least one victim uh, in bondage. So what does that all mean? We know that BTK used autoerotic fantasies and masturbation over trophies from his victims. So I think he did this to relive his crimes and to satisfy his sexual cravings. 
And the reason I think that's relevant is because I think it in part explains the long periods of time or the cooling off periods between all of his murders. So as we know, he committed this over the space of three decades, which is very unusual. So I think like most serial killers, he would have had this craving and this urge, but he was able to, to kind of dismiss it or reduce it temporarily because he had these trophies and because he could masturbate over them. So at the risk of sounding facetious, I suppose it's a bit like, you know, a smoker who's addicted to cigarettes. He can't stop his addiction, but he can certainly take the craving away by, you know, vaping or using patches, but it's still always there in the background. So I think that's what happened with BTK. Another interesting aspect, in my opinion, of the BTK case is that he described this like alter ego and he put a bit of respect. So he, he saw himself as like a terrorist on a mission, like Osama bin Laden, for example, rather than a serial killer. Now, I've seen other psychoanalysis of this case questioning whether he had split personality disorder. I refute that. I think that's wrong and I'll explain why. So split personality is called dissociative identity disorder is often misunderstood. What it boils down to is, is when this exists, there are more than one different entities and there's a disassociation. So there's a lack of awareness of what the other entity is doing and who they are. So they don't share the same memories. They have different characteristics, different personalities, different everything. And it comes from people who have had extreme levels of trauma when they're younger. So repeated physical or sexual abuse, and they split off different, different memories and different parts of themselves and, and they create these personalities. So I don't think any of that is relevant for BTK. I think he's just, he just likes to separate himself from his actions because it helps him deal with the ethics of it all rather than because he's unable to control different personalities. I should say that some psychiatrists actually even dispute dissociative identity disorder. They refute this as, as an actual diagnosis and that's because it's extremely rare. Personally, I've never actually seen a case of this. I've seen several people try to fake it during criminal trials, which I think is why some people are very skeptical about it. Another element of this case that really interests me is BTK's narcissism. I mean, this really shines through. He sees himself as a natural born predator. He has compared himself to like a venomous snake or a shark. Even to this day, he's completely unrepentant and he has no remorse. What I think is interesting is he appears to have separated or compartmentalized the responsibility or the heinous kind of actions, the ethics of what he's done from the glamour of being a serial killer. So I use the, the term glamour very loosely. That's, that's his kind of perception of it, not mine. Don't cancel me. I think another way that his narcissism has really shone out was the way that he's been taunting people. So eventually this led to his downfall. So he taunted the police, goaded them into trying to catch him. But more than that, and more subtly, I think he was taunting society. So BTK was hiding in plain sight because he actually fit into society quite well. He wasn't like a loner or a weirdo. He was active in his church. He was a Boy Scout leader. In his mind, he was playing a game against the community around him. And ultimately, his narcissism tripped him up. Another element of BTK's narcissism was the way that he responded to reporters. So after his arrest, whilst he was in prison, a number of reporters reached out to him. And he was apparently very keen to have his story heard. He would write them these long, rambling letters. And yet another aspect of his narcissism is that he tries to take credit for not killing more frequently. And he's even said that he believes that lives have been saved and that society owes him a debt of gratitude because he didn't kill more despite his natural inclinations. So again, I think that this all indicates that BTK is a typical psychopath as opposed to a sociopath. So psychopaths are like a more dangerous versions of sociopaths. They're a lot more cunning, a lot more sneaky, and they can fit into normal society. So sociopaths have the same sort of murderous rage, but they can't contain it or hide it as well. They're not as good at disguising themselves or camouflaging themselves into society. BTK was good at that. So that's why I think he's more of a psychopath than a sociopath. So that in a nutshell is my psychoanalysis of the BTK case. If you're interested in what I'm talking about, so that's, you know, mental illness with a little sprinkling of psychiatry, then you've got to go and check out my YouTube channel. It's called A Psych for Sore Minds. I've actually done several episodes on psychopaths. I've got a video about the difference between psychopaths and sociopaths. So I've given you a little taste here, but I go into it in a lot more detail. And I've got a series about psychopaths, including my own personal experiences of trying to rehabilitate psychopaths and working for a person who in my mind, although it was never formally diagnosed, was actually a psychopath. Anyway, enough for me. Back to Tom and Ben for the rest of this episode. 
Thank you very much to Dr. Dastir for his clinical input on the BTK killer. Fascinating as always. I right now we're going to look into the aftermath and discuss some trivia and then go on to our lookalikes. So the initial uh, psychological evaluation felt that Raider very much felt like he was ignored by his mother during his formative years. And that may have led to his continued yearning for attention. He was also regarded as highly narcissistic, the very, very strong need for him to be recognised. And at any point when other people tried to take responsibility or credit, or that he felt that he went without recognition, mm. he would it, it, feel the escalations burn within him. So when he worked for ADT installing home security systems from 1974 until 1988, he used this as, as a time to essentially map out potential victims, even just layouts of houses, just kind of he'd get to know the general areas. He looked at this as a work perk. The creepy thing, I think we did a post on this on our Instagram, of a person fitting alarms, yeah, yeah. and he more than likely was fitting alarms for people who were worried about him entering the house. This case is the reason why I sort of behave a bit more macho around plumbers, electricians, builders, oh. just so they know. I don't imagine you were macho at all. What do you do? Yeah, you get sparky is that, out. Is that your baseball bat or mine? Is that one of mine? Because I've got several baseball bats, mate. Careful of that dog. Do you want a cuppa? I'm just off to my kickboxing class. I'm a gold belt champion. How much, uh, how much longer are you going to be? That sort of thing. So Raider's wife noticed that the taunting letters to the BTK killer sent to the police were full of the same horrendous misspellings as the letters she received from her husband. She didn't say anything more than a passing joke. You spell just like the BTK. Little did she know. So Raider kept a box of mementos from the killings in the house, but uh, his wife never discovered the box. In later confessions from prison, he'd always kind of toy with the idea of eventually taking responsibility and just admitting the fact that he was a cold-hearted killer. Not before blaming two other people or two yeah. other demons uh, for their roles in the murders. He would go on to say, I personally think, and I know it's not very Christian of me, but I think it's actually a demon that's within me. At some point in time, it entered me when I was young and it basically controlled me from that point onwards. Describing how two demons he calls Batter and Factor X made him the way he was, which would go on to commit those terrible crimes. Raider went on to say, I blame Batter. He or it became the physical escape goat, sort of a metaphoric frog-looking dragon. I liked frogs and collected figurines at home, probably childhood days fishing at my grandparents' farm pond and big bullfrogs at the pond. Actually, the real demon is what I call Factor X. I have now figured it out. I know why I do these dark deeds. It is no more a mystery to me. So in a way, yes, Batter or Factor X did make me the way I was as I committed those terrible crimes. So yeah, it's weirdly trying to pass on the buck, but also he still wants full credit. He does, he does later on, he does he claim more of the responsibility. Doesn't really know, seem to know what he's doing there. The thing we didn't really touch on in the timeline is Raider also used dolls and cereal boxes to showcase his various unsolved crimes. He would often tie the dolls up in the same way that he, he had tied the, the victims up. He would leave them on, on parked cars randomly around. So the police would know that it would be him because obviously he, only he would know how they were tied up. And he also wrote killer on a couple of the boxes for serial killer. So they said he had no sense of humour. Yeah, he also, uh, amongst those dolls that he made, he sent one very small doll with a metal pipe strapped to her back and that was to basically taunt local police about the murders of the Atoro family. So Raider's daughter Kerry, who I mentioned earlier on, did try and keep in contact with her father, writing her letters in prison. As he said, when she grew up, she saw him as a great father. They were very close. She couldn't believe that you know he had done all these things. At first, I think she did give him some distance and started writing to him. As the kind of weird way that their life goes, a lot of people have been writing to BTK in, in prison, thinking that he's a legend of, you know, serial killers and people look make him into a dark hero. He was very weird with his daughter. He would say that, you'd try and say that, she, you know, she had similar traits to him. They were very similar because she went to the newspaper and wanted to discuss all these things like he did. He wanted to get notoriety from going to the papers, which very different, yeah, very yeah. different things. She wrote a book called A Serial Killer's Daughter. One of the people sent the book in for him to sign it and she'd already signed it. He signed his signature over hers. He was so um, narcissistic and 
he just yeah she basically after a while writing to him just cut all ties with him because just just he was just you know too much and he was getting sent screenshots of things that she posted on social media and he was seeing these things it's just very very peculiar behavior no one would know unless they're in the situation if they found out their father was that way and you know i know his wife yeah i think she wrote a couple of letters and then completely just yeah. moved on same with the son the son it? yeah the son is, he's never gone out in the public about this i think he joined the army as well but he's very much set out the, the limelight whereas kerry's kind of come in the, the forefront and trying to help as much as she can i guess i mean she's written a few books as i said a serial killer's daughter my story of faith a very peculiar situation to find yourself in for the otero house obviously the site of the first btk killings the family home still exists and it is privately owned so there are people living within that house. Of that video um, where he's kind of making his kind of court confession, mm. there's a really warped quote that Rady uh, references in, in describing why he decided to take Josephine down to the basement and strap her to the, the, uh, the metal pole. He goes on to say, I probably would have hung the little girl. Like I said, I'm pretty mean or could be. But on the other hand, I'm very, you know, I'm a nice guy trying to say that he put her out of a, you know, out of a misery, put a, you know, relatively painless death. Yeah, I mean, with this for me, I thought before doing this, he was very calculated, very clever. And this before I looked into it properly and meticulous. Weirdly, from looking into this in depth, he's come across very, just so narcissistic and so... Chauvinistic as well. Full of himself, you know, thinking he's a legend, thinking that he's smarter than everyone. He just, I mean, he can't read a room in terms of he thinks people want to hear him say all this stuff and they want to hear all this and it's it's very, very, very peculiar. So Dennis Rader is 77 years old at the time of recording and he is still serving his 175-year sentence at the El Dorado Correctional Facility. The killer from the movie The Clove Hitch Killer was inspired by the acts of Dennis Rader. Also, obviously, we've referenced it a few times in this episode. Uh, he's frequently played by actor Sonny Valicenti in the Netflix series Mindhunter. Also, the movie Funny Games. Have you ever watched, have you ever watched that? Yeah. That also reminds me of like a slightly more cinematic behaviours of BTK. In a way. In a way. Stephen King also has a novella uh, called A Good Marriage uh, and a film based on that. And he has gone on to say that both were inspired by the BTK killer. And now it's time for some lookalikes, Ben. How did you get on with these? I had a good time finding lookalikes for BTK. He's got one of those faces. I think I've got about seven. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Shall I start with the one I think you're going to like? I mean, I'd big this up to Tom before you do we sat that down. regularly. But this one I think you're going to like. I thought we both had the same one, and this one will hit Tom in his... Bring him a good memory back. Hit him in the funny bone. There's that smile. Um, I've gone with Mr. Feeney from Boy Meets World. And I would say that's one of my better ones. You put pressure on it, Ben. That's what right. you always do. Look at the face. Happier. I love Feeney. Yeah, I love Feeney. But... Do I think he looks like him? I think I'm going to get some support on that one. Okay, that's great. Keep going. Uh, okay, I've got Al McQuiggan from Toy Story. Or Al McQuiggan. He steals Woody. He, mm. no, okay, all right, that's fine. I've got more. Yeah, you've um, got seven. I've got plenty. Ken Bone in his younger days. Who's Ken Bone? He's a politician, uh, sports anchor. Oh, do you know him, do you? Uh, yeah. All right, I've got, <laughs> what do you know right, him from? What's here's a good what's one. Sport? What's what's what? Basketball. Oh yeah, big politics, basketball fan. Yeah, big basketball man, big time. Pat, you do not know basketball you if you searched, do not know. You search man Ken with moustache and bald man, and it came out, didn't you? Bald with goatee. <laughs> yeah. um, I've then also this is a better one. Actor Michael Ironside. No, I don't think. I'm really is. confident with mine. So oh, but let me get mine out of the way then. <laughs> um, that's the spirit. Red from that '70s show. Yep, that's one of mine. The older and more settled brother of Walter White from Breaking Bad. Oh, that's lazy. Okay. Um, Settle what, what, one accidental one I found this morning. He looks a bit like Dr. Todd Grande. Um, brilliant YouTuber. I was watching his analysts on BTK and they, they look pretty good together. Looks like his dad, maybe. I love how your lookalikes go from it could be his dad. <laughs> well, this one's going to annoy you then. Well. Someone put a bald filter on Dwight from The Office. I was going to say Dwight weirdly earlier on. Yeah, just just no so six misses and one hit the red one's a hit because i got the same one oh uh, right so many show but um i got ken landweir was a big policeman on the, the case as well i've got one for him as well i think he looks a little bit like ray romano yeah that's pretty good and the other one which i did a bit of work on it to make it look more like him uh, this is my first look that i got straight away 
I'm very proud of this one. I think it's spot. It's more kind of your level, as in your the brain from Pinky in the Brain. Um, That's fucking good. Dan, do you have a little look? That's probably my favourite one I've done from the whole series. No, you've done well there. The eyes and just the sunken in big forehead. Yeah, no, you've done well. Is that his hair that you first? I put on? the hair and his moustache on. The yeah. actual BTKs. That actually is, yeah. Yeah, well done. Uh, that's yeah, but I mean, I think red's probably the yeah your the best photo one. of red. So between us, we we've done pretty well. But I, the brain, uh, there's something about the big head. I think Mr. Feeney is gonna. I think I'm gonna have some people in the comments section support. I'm sure me. you will. Yeah, I'm sure you will. People will. Pretend Thank you, that you were right. People tend to like me. I know, Ben. Feels supportive of you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you and I love you all. All right, guys. And that is the case of the BTK killer, Dennis Raider. If you haven't had enough and you want more content over on our Patreon page, we have a different Minnesota every week. It works out roughly a pound a week. Mm -hmm. Well over 60 cases on there now. Yeah, we do requests over there. We do poll vaults and poll votes as well. What's the vaults we do? Uh, we just jump in, uh, jumping up the charts, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Keep what, telling you. Uh, they they're not relative. They don't actually go. No, on. no, no. But um, but we do case votes. Yeah, we do that. On Patreon, yeah. I mean, we, if you want to see us go poll vo vaulting, we could, I don't know, people like different things, as I said at the start. But no, thank you so much for everyone that's... Um, Dan's face. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so, so much for everyone that's uh, listened, that's watched the episodes. We, we're on audio platforms. We're on YouTube. Thank you so much as well for everyone that's been telling their friends about us. So many people have been messaging saying, oh, I've got this person onto you. I've got that person onto you. We love it. We love to see it. We love to hear it. So thank you so much for that. We're going to be back next week with Jeffrey Dahmer. Very rarely can we confirm the case we're covering next week, but this week we can. Next week is the case of Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, so be sure to sink your teeth into that next week. And guys, like we always say... We say this all the time. Keep doing what you're doing. Well, keep it off floppy disks and trolling. Don't troll, please. Yeah. Um, starting a barber shop and having a pool hall. You can do that. That's absolutely fine. Should There should be more of those about. I what would you call it? Cut and pot. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> See that too, Pip. Cut and pop. <laughs> <laughs> that was terrible. Pot and cut. Yeah. I'd run a better head, 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 head when I did it. I'd call it Black Bull's Barbershop. I bet you would, you dirty sod.